You have called President Trump's behaviour this morning, rather surprisingly, impressive since he's been in London. But you've also cautioned that his rhetoric can be divisive, hate-filled and antagonistic. So where do you stand on President Trump? Well, I think even I've got to give credit. In three and a half years, uh, there's been a day where he's been impressive. Uh, I should give credit where it's due. Mm -hmm. My concern as the Mayor of uh, London is here in the UK, uh, we feel the long shadow of Donald Trump's uh, agenda but also how the rise of the far right extends beyond the USA and is felt here. So we see it, for example, in the fact that you've got politicians in the UK uh, and those in the far right uh, copying uh, Donald Trump. We see in Hungary, in Italy, in uh, Poland, in France, uh, members of the far right movement, people who support populist uh, nativism, mm -hmm. uh, having Donald Trump as their poster boy. And it's a huge source of concern for me as the mayor of the most diverse city in the world who believes in pluralism and liberal values. Which politicians in the UK do you see as copying President Trump in those respects? Well, Boris Johnson, uh, Nigel Farage. We see on the extreme far right uh, parties who have been banned like Britain First, having their tweets uh, retweeted by uh, Donald Trump. You've got leaders of far right movements here in the UK who are deemed to be racist, uh, having Donald Trump as their poster boy. We've seen. Uh, leaders in Hungary and Poland using really disparaging language, demonising immigrants and minority communities, having Donald Trump as their poster boy. We see it in France, we see it uh, in other parts of Europe. And I think what, what uh, people in the USA may not realise is when you are president of a wonderful country like uh, the USA, the most diverse multicultural country in the world, to have your president uh, uh, saying things like he said, doing things like he's uh, done, causes many of us huge concern. Since you've been mayor, have you detected an increase or a difference in the demonisation of immigrants or minorities in the capital here in the UK? Oh, without doubt. We've seen a demonisation of not just minorities, but immigrants. We've seen an increase in hate crime. I'm not saying all of it lays at the door of Donald Trump, but I'll tell you this. There are people here who uh, mimic him and uh, copy him and he gives them su uh, succor. He gives them confidence uh, and views that used to be in the periphery. People who used to be in the margins are now in the uh, mainstream. And you see some of the languages used by our own mainstream politicians. They've seen that Donald Trump's playbook leads to electoral success. And they're using the same tactics here in the UK. They're using the same tactics, by the way, in Hungary, look at Orban. In Poland, look at Duda. In Italy, look at Salvini. In France, look at Le Pen. So these are people who've seen uh, that the sort of uh, methods used by this man uh, lead to electoral success. Uh, so the ends are successful. The means lead to uh, fears being stoked against minority communities. They've led to a rise in uh, hate crime. And it's the very opposite of what NATO was all about, the very opposite of what the EU was all about, the very opposite of the multilateralism that the US and the UK have led on for the last 70 years. And I'll get to NATO in just a second, but what do you think is going on in society, that speaks specifically about the UK obviously because that's where we are, that leads, that means that those types of characters, those politicians with their previously fringe beliefs, demonising minorities and immigrants, why does that lead to electoral success in the United Kingdom? Well, I think what you're seeing is around the world, uh, people who aren't seeing the fruits of globalisation who are concerned about the fact that their lives aren't improving. And what they're seeing is politicians who are playing on their fears, playing on their anxieties, rather than addressing their uh, fears and their anxieties. So if, for example, you as a politician blame the other for the reason why you can't get a decent job, blame the other for the reason why you can't get decent health care, why you can't get decent schools, it's quite tempting and intoxicating to believe that because you're being sold a pup. And so the challenge I'd say to us politicians who are pluralistic and progressives is we've got to address people's concerns and make sure we realise that there's a vacuum that's been filled by people like Donald Trump and uh, Salvini and uh, Duda and uh, Orban and Johnson and uh, Farage. And the bad news is that has led to electoral success around the world and you know Donald Trump is their poster boy. With, with the NATO meeting that's happening at the moment for the 70th anniversary, there's been a lot of discussion about the evolution of the threats that are facing NATO countries and how that can be addressed. Chief among them is Islamic fundamentalism and radicalisation. And obviously we have seen that on the streets of London. Do you feel like NATO needs to do more than it's currently doing to combat those threats? One of the things that NATO is doing is look at the whole issue of terrorism and countering terrorism. They've got forces deployed in Afghanistan 
and in Iraq really important. One of the reasons why it causes us concern is when the President of the USA calls NATO obsolete or makes threats to leave NATO because it's so important. We should all be worried about uh, terrorism and extremism, not just from so-called Islamist groups, but also from the extreme far right we saw in a synagogue in uh, America, uh, the consequences of the far right going to synagogue and killing innocent Jewish uh, men and women we've seen in Christchurch, New Zealand, the consequences of the extreme far right going into to a mosque we saw in Finsbury Park in 2017. Mm -hmm the far right, but also we see Islamist terrorists as well, motivated by a perverse form of Islam. We saw, unfortunately, last Friday in London Bridge in uh, this terrorist responsible mm -hmm. for two deaths. And so I think we've got to make sure we work together. These, this, that's a good example of the sort of threat ca that can only be dealt with across borders, whether it's terrorism, whether it's migration from the Southern Hemisphere, that's a big source of concern, whether it's climate change. These sorts of challenges uh, are cross-border. And that's why it's so important for uh, the leader of the USA uh, to not give the impression that he's going to be protectionist. Uh, and the concern we have is when Donald Trump, when President Trump talks about America first, does he really mean white America first? And that's a big concern for many of us. Do you think he does mean white America first? Well, I think you judge somebody by what they say and by what they do. And as far as we can see from London, uh, President Trump has said on many, many occasions and done things on many, many occasions they give us huge source, a huge source of concern. and gives us the impression that all he cares about is uh, white America. When we hear a mainstream politician, no, when you see the president of the most diverse country in the world uh, whipping up a crowd into a frenzy, mm -hmm. so they say, quote unquote, send them, send them back against four politicians who are politicians of color. When you see a politician, uh, sorry, not a politician, but the president of the USA, mm -hmm calling people rapists because they happen to be Mexican or having a travel ban against people of my faith, that leads to huge concerns across the world. Mm -hmm. Now, you're obviously a member of the Labour Party and that's the party that you stand for. Given that there's been nine years of austerity under the Conservatives and they are still currently leading in the polls as unpredictable as they can be, do you attribute some of the lack of success that the Labour Party is currently having to the leadership? Because Jeremy Corbyn himself has come under quite a lot of criticism, particularly around issues of anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Well, there's, you know, there's a number of issues there. Firstly, uh, there is an issue with the Labour Party you know, addressing serious concerns around anti-Semitism uh, of members of the Labour Party quickly enough. Mm -hmm. Anti-Semitism is racism. We can't have a hierarchy of racism. Racism is racism. And we're a party whose roots are anti-racist. It is the case though, and it breaks my heart to say this, that we've been too slow. Uh, mm -hmm. Many of my Jewish friends uh, have said they can't vote Labour because they think we're racist. Uh, and we've got to address those concerns. We can't deflect because people's motivation may be anti-Labour. These are genuine concerns people have. Mm -hmm. There's a second issue about the polls, which frankly speaking, aren't looking good for my party. Let's wait and see how the general election pans out. There are still a number of days to uh, go. Uh, like many Labour members, supporters, activists, I'm spending a lot of time knocking on doors, trying to persuade people mm -hmm. to lend us their vote, making the point that the choice of this election is between a Brexit backing, austerity loving Conservative Party or a Labour government that will give the British public uh, a final say on whether we should stay or leave the European Union now that we know what it entails but also in end austerity once and for all and it's the big choice people have to make on December the 12th. Are you happy with the <coughs> direction of the Labour Party that you see it's travelling in? Well I think we've got a big election on December the 12th, we want to win that general election. Um, you know, I'm the Mayor of London, my job is to govern for London, sometimes that means uh, you know, working with a Conservative government. Uh, sometimes it means challenging a Labour Party I belong to. My job as the Mayor of London mm. is to do what's best in my city's interests. And, you know, I, I've had issues I've raised publicly and privately about my party. Mm -hmm. Similarly, I have issues I've raised publicly and privately with a Conservative uh, government. I've got to be a Mayor for all Londoners. Mm -hmm. Finally, Jack Merritt's father, one of the, the victims of the terror attack last Friday, has cautioned against politicising the incident and using it as an excuse to advocate for harsher sentencing. <coughs> but as Mayor of London, what do you think needs to be done in order to protect the citizens of the, the capital? Well, the, the first point I'd make is we saw uh, last Friday the very worst of humanity in this terrorist, but also we saw the very best of humanity. And, uh, you know, Jack and uh, Saskia dedicated their lives at a young age to helping other people. It's quite inspirational. Mm -hmm. We saw brave Londoners, ordinary Londoners go above and beyond uh, to stop further people being the victims of this uh, uh, terrorist. I think 
There are important lessons we have to learn. We've got to make sure we avoid a situation where somebody who's clearly a danger to the public uh, appears uh, to have been released and not properly supervised. There are big questions that need to be asked. Um, there, is a, there is an investigation that's live and the review's taking place, so, so I don't want to breach any confidences. But mm -hmm. I think the legitimate questions that the public are asking, I'm asking, that deserve answers. There's a separate issue about not having a knee-jerk response. One of, the, one of the temptations for politicians is to respond in a knee-jerk fashion to an atrocity. We shouldn't do that, but I think it's important that we do reflect if any lessons uh, can be learned. Mm -hmm. Sadiq Khan, thank you very much for your time today. Pleasure. Appreciate it.